In this, the second part of our two-part series on primal fitness, we welcome Brad Kearns, co-author of many of Mark Sisson's books, including Primal Endurance, the host of the B-Rad podcast, former professional triathlete and world champion endurance athlete, and a guy who remains incredibly competitive in sports and fitness to this day, defying the usual laws of aging. Our conversation with Brad was awesome. We really took a hard look at the fitness industry, where the opportunities are for change and why. It's Brad's assertion, and we agree, that the fitness industry is due for a major renaissance. In part, it would serve us well to stop thinking of fitness as a separate component from health, as in the often used phrase, the health and fitness industry. Fitness is health. When fitness is done right and care is taken to avoid overreaching, overtraining, injury, and burnout. This is just a really great conversation with Brad, and we do hope you'll enjoy it and maybe start to reconsider how you view human fitness for your clients. Once again, please welcome our guest, the always entertaining and thought provoking Brad Kearns. Hi, I'm Erin Power. And I'm Laura Rupsis. We're certified health coaches, and this is Health Coach Radio. This podcast is about the art, science, and business of health coaching. We share our insider tips to help you become a better coach and entrepreneur. And we interview expert guests to discover how they've made it in this growing field. It's time for health coaches to make an impact. It's time for Health Coach Radio. All right. Today on Health Coach Radio, we have the fabulous Brad Kearns back. How are you, Brad? Oh my gosh, I'm fantastic. I'm so happy to connect with you guys and be back on Health Coach Radio. I know. So we have you on for a very special reason. Uh, Spoiler alert, we're coming out with a very special course that you helped us write, the Primal Fitness Coach Certification. Huge news. And we handpicked you, actually, because you seem to be the perfect fit to write this curriculum. Why don't you give our audience a little bit of a background story on you and kind of why you're the perfect fit for this. It is huge news because it's an absolutely huge course. And we've been talking about it for so long and realizing that the, the, the foundation of, of taking the health coach curriculum and learning all about primal living has been, you know, well received over the past, uh, well, geez, it's been what, how many years, seven or eight years since the, yeah. since this whole deal started. Uh, but, you know, fitness is becoming, I think more and more popular, especially with quarantine, people are doing it on their, on their own. And now the gyms are back open and people are heading back. And I just see like an explosion or an awakening of the importance of fitness in a general life for health, vitality, longevity. And it's really great to see, because of course, you know, we've been in the fitness game forever, uh, but it's been overlooked by uh, people like my peers, my old friends, you know, some people just don't work out. They just sit in a car, they go to the building they sit at the desk, they consume digital entertainment at night. And now I see sort of a cultural trend um, in favor of realizing that we want to get out there and move our bodies. And at the same time, uh, that's the good news. I'm also seeing these unfortunate trends uh, prevail in the fitness scene, which is this struggle and suffer approach uh, as a sort of a, a foundation or an ethos of how to get your body into good shape. And it's glamorized and glorified by the, um, no offense, six pack females on the magazine covers, like really, uh, <laughs> I, I refer you to, um, Olympic runner, uh, Lauren Fleshman. She has a blog article showing, um, pictures of herself taken during the same week. And one of them was on the runway, all greased up and, um, with the perfect lighting and her glistening six pack. And then another one was like a cameo, uh, while she was doing a workout and, She's like, everyone has thigh cheese, even Olympic runners was her, her caption. It was hilarious because she showed how you can manipulate what the, what the person really is like just from, you know, that uh, sensationalized image. But we're, you know, we're marching down this path and we're luring in the average, uh, well-meaning uh, health enthusiast who tiptoes over to the gym, hoping to do themselves a solid and get their life on track and get into the fitness realm. And uh, in many cases, they get they get toasted by uh, the um, the mentality and the programming 
And I'm especially picking on the mainstream programming because the most popular modes of fitness programming are by and large inherently overly stressful and putting an enthusiast at risk of breakdown, burnout, illness, and injury. And uh, for those watching on video, you guys are both nodding your heads. We all know this when we're inside the scene and living and breathing this every day. But unfortunately, the average person is going in there, uh, turning their life over, putting it into the hands of uh, perhaps it's a, a Peloton workout that they're doing at home, or it's a trainer, or it's a group class with 27 other people. And uh, there's not enough attention, in my opinion, to that individualized, sensible, baby steps approach to fitness where everything feels enjoyable. You make little progress, you make small celebrations and small, uh, small victories, and you're never in that state of mind where you dread it, which is, it's so common. And then we have the attrition rates, which um, are validated to be extreme in things like the group uh, training programs, like where they get together and they train for six months to compete in a, a destination event, a goal event, like a marathon. And boy, isn't that great? You went from the couch to the marathon in six months, and then it's on your wall. And that's the last fitness objective you've done in the last five years, because it just wasn't, it wasn't a good fit. And that's not answering your, your tee up question, Laura. So um, that's just my, um, that's just, that's just on my mind right now as we, as we get into how this course is so different. Uh, but for those who don't know me that are listening, um, I please direct you to your previous shows where we talked at length about all kinds of fun stuff in my background, but I'm a lifelong athlete. I've been in the fitness scene for so long and I was formerly a professional triathlete. Um, I had a great uh, experience in my youth of pursuing my dream for a career and for my, my competitive aspirations. And I raced on the pro circuit all over the world for nine years at my best. I was national champ. I was ranked number three in the world. So I reached these really high levels as an athlete, but I also got my ass kicked so many times and had such pain and suffering of, of the psychological form as well as the physical form and had to learn uh, the hard way that it's really important to emphasize the process. It's to emphasize personal growth and development rather than being obsessed and fixated on outcomes, because that's when you struggle. That's when you make mistakes. And so when I was able to get into that uh, center of power where my motivation was completely pure and I love what I was doing every day and I love to get on that bike seat and go off and pedal into the mountains for five hours and come back with a smile on my face and eat a nutritious meal and take a nap and then head over to the swimming pool and have some more fun swimming back and forth laps. When I was enjoying it to that level, that's when I was able to perform at my best. And at those other times when I was caught up in the business aspects of being an athlete, for example, and forcing the process of fitness to happen in a manner that wasn't natural or sustainable, that's when I struggled. And that's when I'd get tossed off the back of the pack anyway, even though I was being all tough and serious and competitive and driven and focused and all these things that we celebrate. So I'm here for the rest of my, you know, my, my, my calling is to share with other people that look, it doesn't have to be pain and suffering. You don't have to grit your teeth or, you know, brave the minus 20 degree weather in Canada to get out there and put in your mileage. Otherwise, you're going to get out of shape. And uh, that's what I have fun doing and love to connect with you guys on that level. Even from the coaching space, we're talking about doing everything in that manner, your dietary transformation and so forth. Uh, but I'm sure we'll, we'll redirect the conversation into the fitness and the specifics of how, how this course that we've developed is different. We will. We certainly And now we will. can all take a deep breath. <gasps> okay. We tap our parasympathetic nervous system state, which is another thing that uh, gets missed in the fitness industry as well a little bit. But honestly, Brad, that was such a, a wickedly great just summary of the sort of the, the, the two halves of the, the potential two halves of the fitness culture. We already know the str struggle and suffer half of it, but no one's really been talking about the this sort of more supportive, longevity-inspired, true health. Mark called it utilitarian fitness, which is sort of like a notch almost, I don't know, above or below or lateral to functional. It's like, it's just sort of this basic human stuff. But, but I love how you described it. Um, everything feels enjoyable. You achieve small victories. You never dread it. Attrition becomes a non-issue. And yes. your motivation to move comes from a place of, of happiness and joy. You know, I just had, I onboarded a new client today who one of her many um, 
I guess, struggles with, with her body and with food and with her health is that she feels like she has to do these punishing workouts seven days a week, these punishing cardio, sort of chronic cardio workouts. And when I asked her, you know, why that felt important to her, all of her answers around these workouts came from a, from a place of fear. There's fear, terrified of what happens if she lets go of this intense workout schedule. My body's going to change. I won't be fit. You know, just fear, 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 fear. Her motivation to do the workouts was fear and just worry. And so now you're flipping the script and saying, let's do it from a perspective of pure motivation and joy and happiness, which is such a paradigm shift, like an absolute paradigm shift, but one that the industry is, I think, uh, speaking as a 30 year fitness industry vet, it was ripe for this um, renaissance for sure. So anyways, that was just a bravo Mm -hmm. sort of summary of where we're at and what brought us here. So thank you for that. Um, Yeah. Thoughts on that? I think uh, one thing to add on that is after uh, spreading this message for many years, uh, I've noticed there's a lot of inherent realization and understanding of it. It's not a radical new thing that we have to beat into your head and convince you that uh, Brad's message makes sense. Everyone realizes this deep down. Yeah. And so then I go in for the kill, especially when I'm dealing with one-to-one client situation or, or when I have that opportunity to say, look, you know this to be true, but you're still out there uh, you know, playing out, let's say, your fears, your insecurities, your obsessive compulsive behavior tendencies, and all these things tend to continue to sprinkle into the mix. So that's when the individual, uh, with the support of a, a great caring coach, is compelled to look in the mirror and ask yourself, why the heck are you doing this to your body? Or why are you pursuing your fitness goals in general? And and stay connected to that purpose at all times, because it's easy to get the ego brought into the mix where you forget about your highest ideals and your values. And I laugh because I'm thinking of these questionnaires that I would give to uh, my triathlete uh, clients. And they'd say, uh, you know, what are your goals for the season? What are your highest purpose in all? You know, I'd ask these big picture questions and they'd be like, I want to be a role model to my children ages 10 and 12 as I complete the Ironman and cross the finish line and they can cheer for me. And I'm like, your kids 10 and 12 don't give a crap about what dad's doing for 16 hours out there all day long while they're getting dragged around to watch the bike finish and then the run start and then the run, you know, they want to go get some cotton candy and some ice cream and and play some video games and go to the beach. So uh, don't kid yourself that this is some, something beyond, um, you know, the the personal growth aspects. And I think that part, and then on your day-to-day training decisions, we have to put the ego aside. If, if desired, or if we don't want to put the ego aside and we want to just admit that, hey, I need an outlet for my obsessive compulsive tendencies and my frustration dealing with the workplace or the home. And so I'm just going to go blast another workout. That's okay. I'm not going to judge that anymore, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. It's okay. You do what you want to do with your life, but just be really clear about your purpose so that you don't then complain four months later that you have an overuse injury and you're so unlucky. And now you're going to have to try some different shoes because uh, there goes your feet again. And and that's, that's about being honest and being, you know, kind of uh, vulnerable with uh, your contribution as the individual to the, uh, the quote unquote problem or whatever's not is completely satisfying. Yeah. yeah. Well, I like that. That was good because a coach, a coach's job is to help the client connect to values. Like, why is this really important to you? And sometimes the client can, they can kind of fake you out. Like you gave the example of the role (laughs) model and, and, you know, we, we come at this non-judgmentally. I want to role model, you know, health and fitness for my kids. Well, why is that important to you? Or like, what does that look like for them? What type of behavior do you want to model for them? Obsessive exercise or, or longevity or an easy relationship with your body. Like we can go deeper and actually, and that's in my mind, the most important role of a coach is to truly connect to intrinsic motivations and values because the fitness industry does hit it at kind of a shallow angle and people, people know the right things to say to sound motivating, but what is the real motivation? So truly the fitness industry has kind of been missing this kind of has literally been missing this, I think. And I would say this with great respect to all my personal trainer peers that we have spent time in the rep counting role long enough. Mm. Um, why, why not have conversations with your clients about what's truly important to them and what's 
what's really motivating them. And, and you know, even this client that I onboarded today, when I asked her, what's motivating you to do these seven workouts a day, she realized like, there's nothing good. There's, it's only fear. It's only fear and control. Mm-hmm. And that was a real aha for her. Nobody had asked her that in specifically with respect to her, her, her first workout addiction. So this is, uh, this is the role of the coach in fitness. And we are certifying fitness coaches in this right. program. Um, what do you think a fitness coach is, Brad? Uh, I guess it's a new term because we um, <laughs> we typically have the trainer um, who's been you know uh, pictured as a as a rep counter. That's sort of a criticism of you know a, a, a basic level trainer. Uh, but there's so many wonderful people and people that have shaped my journey as an athlete that go so far beyond just uh, talking about the nuts and bolts. I was just looking at an email newsletter from this guy, Dan Pfaff, P-F-A-F-F. He's one of the greatest track and field coaches of all time. He's coached many Olympic athletes, uh, specialties in the jumps. Uh, but if you read his sign up for his email newsletters, they're almost, almost, uh, almost none of the content relates to um, technique instruction and his areas of expertise. Um, I'm thinking of Kelly Starrett too, prominent name in the fitness scene. I did a long podcast with him, maybe close to two hours, and he almost didn't cover his area of expertise. He was more talking about uh, plugging your mobile phone in the hallway instead of the bedroom and hitting that point so hard. And it's like, wait, are you going to talk about shoulder mobility? <laughs> no, because he's trying to look at this big picture and realize why people are coming into overuse injuries in the fitness scene. And it's because they're not giving themselves adequate rest as a small aside example. And so I like uh, pulling that perspective out. And I think we did a good job in the course uh, trying to go beyond. I mean, if, if you're looking at um, the need to become competent in all manner of fitness instruction and knowledge, you're going to get some great uh, videos and commentary about deadlift form and, and reps and um, proper design of a workout. But I think we try to sprinkle in that, that primal health coach uh, oozing message of, Hey, let's, you know, let's remember why we're doing it here and fit these things into overall daily lifestyle conveniently, rather than I think a lot of fitness programming, they assume the, the participant is coming in, with like an Olympic athlete type lifestyle where they're saying, you know, do, do this, do that, do this, do that. And it adds up to, you know, 27 minutes before you start your workout. It's like, wait, my workout's supposed to be 27 minutes. Cause I got to go pick up the kids at nursery school. That, that part's kind of missing too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's interesting when I listen to people who have been in the industry for a very long time and at the top of their game and truly identify as coaches, the podcasts I listen to, a lot of the things that I end up reading about is all about all the other stuff. I mean, we interviewed John Berardi, right? Um, who was like a nutrition PhD, exercise science PhD kind of a guy who wrote a book called, what's it called? Change, Change Maker, I think, right? And it's all about sort of mindset and all the other stuff. The same thing with Kelly Starrett. So I think once a coach really feels as though they've dialed in that side, they're an expert in that. And yeah, that's important and all this other stuff. But I think the longer you're in this business, the more you realize how much more important all the stuff that happens in your client's life outside of that hour that you have with them is. And all the training certifications that are out there only cover that, right? So Hmm. what we've developed here, what we've asked you to to develop is, you know, the expertise in this primal fitness in particular, which we've really kind of coined as, you know, fitness for longevity, for life, a lifestyle of fitness, And then, and and from there, you're just sort of an expert. I think most of the programs out there is they're trainer programs, right? Um, I mean, I, I, I coach at a CrossFit gym down the street here and I've got a tank that says coach. And when I'm there for an hour, I'm not coaching, I'm instructing is what I'm doing. Um, or, or perhaps I'm programming or what happened, but I'm not really coaching in that hour. Coaching is what really happens outside of what's in the gym. And so, when you compile all the aspects of what's going to be the primal fitness coach certification is the expertise in this sort of fitness for function and longevity in life, but then coaching and business. But we really needed to flush out all the details of what that means, right? Not just functional fitness. We talked about utilitarian fitness, but also just 
fitness as a lifestyle is really what I think mm-hmm. you us and added a lot of nuance and detail on how this all fits in. So do you mind walking us through like the actual curriculum and the content that you wrote? Did you say walking? Why? That is a <laughs> wonderful term to use. Well, because I, I think um, if we want to jump to some of the uh, the big takeaways, I think the, the way that this uh, programming uh, differs or stands out is that first and foremost, we reject that flawed mentality of struggle and, struggle and suffer and yeah. do everything possible to get away from anything that has even the slightest whiff of a chronic pattern in your exercise program, because that is truly a disaster. Um, I told you about my triathlon background, and this is you know decades ago, and now it's, it's really tragic to see there's a high prevalence of long-term extreme endurance athletes coming up with heart problems in their later years. And many of my peers have suffered uh, extreme misfortune, like the great Steve Larson, one of the greatest endurance athletes of all time in, in America. He competed in the, in the Giro d'Italia as a pro cyclist. He won the world in Xterra triathlon. He set the bike course record at Hawaii Ironman, and he dropped dead of a heart attack at age 39 while doing a track workout in Bend, Oregon. He left four kids, two businesses. He was a real go-getter. He was still racing at the pro level at age 39 while running two businesses and raising four kids. And you know, this picture of fitness, um, you know, suffered a tragic health consequence and it's not uncommon. Everyone who suffers something thinks it is. And I might get an email from a friend of a friend and they're like, wow, it was a shock that I went into the cardiologist and they said, dude, you need a pacemaker. It's like, it's not a shock anymore. And we're now learning this. There's great content like, um, on a Ted talk, uh, uh, run for your life, but not too far and at a slow pace. That's Dr. James O'Keefe. And he's a leading researcher in the extreme endurance exercise hypothesis. The same thing is playing out in CrossFit. And there's all those jokes about um, you can see the body from across the parking lot, and then you can see the scars up close or, you know, those Mm -hmm. jokes like that, where the physique is incredible, but so many injuries and and so much attrition. And so um, getting away from that, and simplifying the, uh, the objective of being fit or even super fit in a minimal amount of time. And a guy named Mark Sisson started talking about this in 2005, 2006. And it's been nice to see people finally listen to where you can go and with a strategic approach, uh, require very little time devotion and get up to you know, the highest standards for health, longevity, and even peak performance goals. So when we start this course, we spend a lot of time out of the gate uh, talking about this concept of balancing fitness and health or or doing fitness to support health goals. Also plugged to Dr. Phil Maffetone, who's a leader in the endurance scene for many years, best-selling author. And uh, his first book that really captivated me back when I was an extreme hard training competitive athlete It was called in fitness and in health. And he talked about how those are two different things. And that was like a mind blower because if you're walking around with a six pack and the ability to climb the mountain in 17 minutes, you think you're healthy, uh, but not necessarily. Um, So that's our wonderful starting point there. And then uh, when you said walk us through it, the other big, huge one for everyone, and I'm talking about the sedentary population as well as the extreme fitness population, the super fit folks, we all share this incredible obligation to increase all forms of general everyday movement. And especially those of us in the fitness category uh, who seem to be packing some hall passes in the pocket, giving us free reign to not only sit around for the rest of the day because we slam that 6 a.m. spin class, but also to indulge in the celebratory foods of uh, the athletic community. And Mm -hmm. so um, the reason this is becoming so important, there's so much science behind it. We've all seen those headlines sitting in the new smoking. Um, There's an actual scientific phenomenon called the active couch potato syndrome, which is where those with a very uh, sincere devotion to fitness. So let's say they're working out for an hour a day at the gym, seven days a week or whatever, you know, hitting that punch card really nicely. They nevertheless suffer from similar uh, metabolic risk factors to those who are sedentary because of that seven hours a week, 
when you transpose it into the 168 hours there in a week, I don't know how many there are in Canada, but in America, there's 168 hours in a week. Um, that's a small little slice of the pie. So if you're uh, on the subway and sitting at the desk and sitting on the couch for the rest of that time, um, you are causing all kinds of, uh, promoting all kinds of dysfunction and health consequences. And for everyone to embrace this idea of just getting out and walking and realizing that actually counts as an awesome workout and has so many cardiovascular fitness benefits, uh, it goes right in there with those uh, grueling long bicycle rides and, and the glamorous stuff that we tend to fixate on. And so that uh, is chapter two. Maybe we will work our way all the way through the course curriculum unless we get on too many awesome asides. But uh, the first one's talking about how fitness supports health and longevity. And the second one is talking about how to just uh, move more in daily life without that pressure of needing to perform or needing to be in a competitive setting. Because I know a lot of people are intimidated by walking, setting foot in the gym, or even hiring a trainer. Um, and so, you know, um, meet the trainer in the park and you guys are going to walk two laps and that's going to be the beginning of a wonderful relationship where maybe someday down the road, we'll go over to the bench and do some dips, but it doesn't have to be bells and whistles. It can just be those, those baby steps forward. I love the idea of a fitness coach taking a walk with their client. That is actually very cool. Um, yeah, big bucks, big bucks in that. Yeah. I know, but you know, just this is just a personal anecdote when you were sharing that. Um, you know, the idea that walking is the is the foundational exercise. I actually, I, I have articulated that walking is also strength training. And my anecdote is that when gyms closed down, I just doubled down on walking. When gyms opened back up, I got right back under the barbell and hadn't lost strength just by walking, which actually seems counterintuitive. But there's a lot of strength in you know, this bipedal, this very unique bipedal thing that we have going on. And, um, and it is the foundational human movement pattern and we get stronger when we do it. Yeah. That's amazing that you didn't lose any strength. And I've had, uh, several of those revelations in recent years where, um, I haven't been in there in a long time. And then I go in and do, uh, the workout that approximated what I could do when I thought I was in, you know, top form. And so then you realize, geez, uh, we don't need to be so consistent as we've been told and, and pounded into our head. Yeah. Well, or it's like your grip on fitness, body composition, et cetera, shouldn't be so tenuous, right? Where if I go on vacation right. for a week and now I've, you know, <laughs> right. right? Like it, it's, yeah. it should, it should linger. It, it should be the kind of thing you can drop into and out of because the human animal is, is a badass and it, it, you know, it shouldn't be this sort of this very, very delicate balance between being in or out. Yeah, the triathletes, we used to have this saying, it's better to be 10% undertrained than 2% overtrained uh, before a big race. And when you think about like the hardest thing that an athlete is striving for, like finishing an ultra marathon or finishing an Ironman or climbing that mountain peak at the end of the summer that you've been training for diligently for weeks and weeks. Um, Maffeton made a good point on this where he said, you know, the brain doesn't have to be trained to suffer. Your brain will do just fine. And for example, to illustrate this concept, if I come over there and put a gun to your head right now, we are going to run a marathon. I don't care how much training you've missed or made in the last six months, you're going to finish because the brain knows how to suffer and go deep into the well to overcome uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the doubting thoughts and, and get to the top of the mountain or get to the finish line. Um, secondly, the anaerobic muscle fibers also do not need to be trained to suffer or to endure because they are by definition explosive and they work without oxygen to perform brief explosive movements. Therefore, uh, the template workout for whatever fill in the blank that lasts for a long time and you're trying, you're being asked to fire the explosive muscle fibers over and over again is not really training more so than it is just breakdown. Mm -hmm. And so this is where we're getting back to that primal, uh, hopefully a lot of listeners are familiar with that primal blueprint fitness model of doing brief explosive work 
but it doesn't last that long. You go hard and you go home rather than this chronic approach where you're uh, doing yet another set and yet another set and yet another set and, and being told to push it for this last sprint on the bike. Our 10th one is going to be, uh, you know, the, the, the end. And maybe the fourth one would have been a better ending for, for many of the people in there. So you don't have to train the brain. You don't have to train the anaerobic system. And how do you best train the aerobic system? You best train the aerobic system at a very slow, comfortable pace, because that's what the aerobic system is, the fat burning. And we know about the maximum aerobic function heart rate. That's the maximum fat oxidation per minute, approximately 180 minus your age. And those unfamiliar with what that pace feels like for almost everyone is very, very, very comfortable. Mm -hmm. And back when I was a triathlete, at, you know, racing at the highest level, I would do a lot of workouts that were 20, 30, 40, or 50 beats below my maximum aerobic function heart rate, which was 155 when I was younger. So I would go and pedal my bicycle on the flat ground at 105 heartbeat for a couple hours. And that was a wonderful training session, just like walking would uh, generate a heart rate that would be hopefully a couple dozen beats below your maximum aerobic heart rate. And so that is literally an excellent training session in so many ways. And back to your point, Aaron, the aerobic muscle fibers nourish and oxygenate the anaerobic muscle fibers so that the waste product can be removed and they can function optimally. So by walking around, you are indeed honing that anaerobic power and that explosiveness because you're giving your body the, the movement, the blood flowing, the oxygen delivery, the lymphatic system working to uh, to, to keep you uh, pure and, and, and flushed of toxins and so forth. So that's why movement is so important. Mm -hmm. And that's why it indeed will contribute to your badass goals of making the regional CrossFit games or uh, whatever it is that you think is unrelated to walking. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this, this should be the foundational piece for every client that you're working with. It's almost as though they, they need to have homework of what they should be doing outside of working with you, which is finding ways to move more, whether it's taking a walk in the morning or taking a walk at night or standing more at your desk or taking breaks and walking around. Maybe it's parking farther away in the parking lot and forcing yourself to just move more. They're, they're like just baseline movement is tremendous. And then the, the next chapter in the course is about just proper human posture. I see this in my group classes all the time. I'm sure you do, Aaron, too, of people that just don't move well. They don't stand right. They don't sit right. Um, I, I it, you know, I kind of should probably say that in air quotes, but you, you could just tell by looking at them that their posture doesn't, it probably feels natural to them, but it doesn't look healthy. Do you want to speak to that a little bit about what you mean by these natural sort of human healthy postures? Well, I think this, the, the chapter you're talking about starts out with the fundamentals of spinal health, mm -hmm. spinal integrity. And that's yeah. really important because it's pretty easy to get injured uh, when you're doing all manner of fitness endeavors, especially if you are a modern citizen that spends a lot of time in a sitting position. And so we actually go through some intense education about how to stand, sit, lie down, bend over, extend mm -hmm. the body correctly. And there's been so many leaders in this world. So we're bringing in the greatest content from the, the, the greatest uh, leaders like Dr. Esther Gokle and Kelly Starrett. And so it's really um, kind of streamlined into uh, this fitness educational course where we're, we're picking and choosing from uh, people who have spent their life's work doing this. Katie Bowman, I should also mention Nutritious Movement. And I just, um, I, I'm really happy with how the videos came out because there's a lot of written content, but those of, those of us who want to learn in different modalities, you can watch these videos and I promise you it'll be life changing like it was for me when I saw the first presentation of Esther Gokhale at PrimalCon in 2010. And of course I was uh, coordinating the event. So I was busy with my clipboard and my cell phone. And I'm like looking in on all these different presentations at the beautiful beach park where we had it in Southern California. And this lady captivated me because she's getting everybody to sit in a chair properly. Like who knows, you know, what are, you, what are we doing over here? They're just sitting in chairs and they're standing up and they're sitting in chairs again and they're standing up. And then she's going around and checking and poking between your shoulder blades and pushing on the, one inch below your belly button. And I learned that day how to stand correctly for the first time. And I never, not a day has gone by in 12 years where I haven't thought about her tips and those checkpoints 
as I go through my daily life. Because like a lot of uh, modern male humans, especially, I had that hunched over, shoulders forward, neck compressed posture that we see. I think commonly, I see it more in males than females. A lot of females have excellent posture, maybe because they've been reading all the modeling magazines their whole life. Oh my gosh, those are all such judgmental, politically inappropriate comments. But uh, most dudes out there have horrible posture and a lot of it's driven by um, the things we do in hunched over position, texting, driving, Mm -hmm. swimming, cycling. So we're even, even though we're sporty, we're still uh, building into that hunched over posture, uh, bench, bench pressing with poor form. So we spend a lot of time jumping chapters forward to like, look, pinch your shoulder blades together when you bench press and keep them in that position. Oh, Mm -hmm. let's see what your PR drops down to now when you do it correctly. Mm -hmm. Isn't that great news rather than bad news? Uh, but those, those standing sitting fundamentals, uh, for me have been life changing. And just as a quick takeaway, like when you're standing up straight, you want your shoulders in line with your spine. And one way to kind of checkpoint and get into this position is to rotate your palms outward. So your palms are facing forward when you're standing up. And when you gently rotate your palms, I'm not talking about pinching your shoulder blades in an exaggerated manner when it's time to take the picture. Like you see a lot of people in the family portrait, it's just gently rolling those shoulder blades back and down into their safe and retracted position and pretty much preserving these fundamentals when you're doing all manner of athletic activity. So before we talk about how to improve your play at shortstop or on defense in basketball, or when you're doing a deadlift, uh, guess what? They all have that same common denominator of a straight and elongated spine Mm -hmm. and a, you know, protected uh, uh, trunk and core area. And that was really fun to kind of set up the fitness experience with these basics that apply when you're reaching for the a can of beans on the shelf at the grocery store. But of course, none of our clients or market would be doing that, but the point is well taken. Health Coach Radio listeners, have I got a treat for you. To get 72-hour free trial access to Primal Health Coach Institute and a 50% off coupon code, to the How to Become a Health Coach Virtual Summit, featuring video interviews with over 30 industry experts. Visit primalhealthcoach.com forward slash HCR today. It's interesting because I'm I'm heading to a physical therapy appointment after this call. and, And for the first session, we worked on setting my shoulder blades and I'd been doing it wrong. Uh, for my whole life. So that was a little bit of a rude awakening. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I I have this great trainer in Los Angeles, Jeff Page, and he talks about technical failure. So everything you're doing in his workout, uh, one on one is is going to technical failure. And I have such a competitive mentality. And so I'm going to do my 15, uh, 45 degree dumbbell raises. And he goes, that's good at 11. I'm like, he goes, that's good. You're done. (laughs) I'm like, Oh, wait, but I'm not tired yet. I can do more. And for me, that's also a, a breakthrough yeah. to, to leave that competitive intensity in yeah. the proper uh, pocket and go to the, uh, especially a strength training session where you're focused on technique and doing it right mm-hmm. and performing until technical failure and realizing, okay, um, of course, I, I'm not tired yet, but the point here is to execute everything with mm-hmm. precise technique and especially jumping ahead just for a, a quick comment like with running and sprinting, which is my, you know, my passion right now. Uh, there's so much to learn about technique on mm-hmm. what seemingly is the most simple and not technique oriented sport. But we spend a lot of time on that and probably too much time because I insisted on it, but you're going to learn all the technique checkpoints for everything you can imagine. Even the most simple things that you think are, you know, done deal. Yeah. So the next chapter is breathing. So just so we're clear, we've come through fitness for health. We've come through everyday movement, human posture and movement fundamentals. Now we're on to breathing. This was so interesting to me is that the first, you know, four chapters of this course aren't even really about what we typically think of as exercise, but the, we're putting this down in order of importance. So I don't know, give, us, give us the little, the little speech on breathing. Why is this making it to the top of the list on our chapters? Oh my gosh, I thought nothing of this for my whole life, especially as it relates to fitness goals. 
because it seems like we always have plenty of air to breathe mm -hmm. when we're performing. And then I saw Wim Hof become a sensation and he's doing his breathing stuff. And I, I dabbled in that. I tried it a few times and it was fun to see that I could hold my breath for longer and then just let it go. And I went about my, my busy day and my busy life. Uh, but now what we see is this uh, amazing, um, you know, avalanche of information, research and explosion in popularity of intentional breathing for all manner of uh, fitness and life goals. Of course, it's always been there as a centerpiece of yoga and meditation. Uh, but now I think the average person on the street realizes that um, being intentional about your breathing has all kinds of health benefits. You talked about getting into parasympathetic at the start of the show, Aaron, and it's like an instant way to access your physiology. Um, Dr. Huberman has talked about this on lengthy podcasts that uh, if you're unfamiliar with why breathing is so popular, what's the big deal, you can go get a lot of content. One of my favorite books I recommend is called The Oxygen Advantage by Patrick McEwen. And since we not, don't have a, an hour to talk about breathing, um, mm. his, takeaway, uh, his takeaway quip has been another life changer for me. And he says, es essentially, what this is all about is to strive to breathe as minimally as possible through your nose only at all times for the rest of your life. And so this notion that we're supposed to take a deep breath when we're stressed and to take a deep breath, calm down, that's actually the opposite. And when you can minimize your breathing, that's when you can access parasympathetic function. And when you can get good at minimizing breathing during fitness activity, uh, this is a centerpiece of chemistry and biology, the Bohr effect, B-O-H-R. Um, so it's not like someone's new theory and try this at your next workout. This is what a science student will be nodding their head going, oh yeah, the Bohr effect. And the Bohr effect uh, implies that um, the when you can uh, breathe minimally and build up more carbon dioxide because you're not sucking in a ton of oxygen with this heavy breathing that we're inclined to do, especially when we're in sympathetic nervous system dominance. When you can breathe minimally, you build up your tolerance for carbon dioxide in the bloodstream. And when you build up your tolerance, when you have an increased tolerance for carbon dioxide in the bloodstream, you deliver more oxygen to the working muscles and tissues that need it. So the, minimal, the, the more minimal you're breathing, the more oxygen delivery to muscles and tissues. It seems kind of backwards, like when we're sucking in air and thinking that's gonna help us get more air to perform better, um, it's actually, we need to breathe as much as we need to breathe so we don't pass out. So when I provide that quote, breathe as minimally as possible through your nose only at all times for the rest of your life, as minimally as possible during my sprint workout, uh, when I'm finished with the sprint, I'm sucking air like nobody's business. I demonstrate on the videos how I finish a sprint. I'm breathing, breathing, breathing like an athlete who just finished a sprint is breathing. And then as quickly as I can, and I'm doing these hand gestures while the cameraman's filming me, as quickly as I can, I'm taking it down, 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 down. And then I draw my uh, finger across my lips and I close my mouth and I lock down and I start breathing aggressively through my nose, of course. And then I take that down, I take that down, I take that down. And then I'm back to minimal nose breathing 27 seconds after a high intensity sprint workout. And it's wow. been nice to see how the skill is building up over time by practicing it. This also minimizes the stress impact of the workout because you're turning on that parasympathetic when you're minimizing your breathing. And so it works at the office when you're trying not to get too stressed and it works during fitness activities. And so uh, there's going to be exercises provided, video instruction. Uh, we, we do give a nod to some of the advanced breathing techniques that people are hearing about. Uh, such as the amazing exploits of Wim Hof and uh, the book called The Wedge by Scott Carney was really amazing. Two books, The Wedge and What Doesn't Kill, what Doesn't Kill Us is the title of the other book. And he was weak to perform these extreme feats of cold exposure and endurance uh, through the breathing techniques that are popularized by Wim Hof. One of them was um, they took a group of 27 uh, various levels of experience in mountaineering and Wim Hof's group climbed Mount Kilimanjaro in just over 24 hours, which destroyed the previous record for ascent because people have to acclimate. It's 19,000 feet at the top. But by going through these breathing exercises, 
uh, before, during, and during the hike, they just marched up the mountain. Even average people, like the author of the books, he's he wasn't you know he's I mean, he's an everyday guy, pretty fit, uh, but he broke through all. He transcended these previous previously believed fitness limitations specifically through breathing exercises. So that's why it deserves a whole chapter in the course. A whole chapter, and it differentiates the program. One of the things, the many things that differentiates this course from so many that are out there. Um, yeah. And wow. if you want to skip it, if you're, if it bores you, if the subject bores you, let me just say this, breathe as minimally as possible through your nose only at all times for the rest of your life. Yes. Love it. So then we get into exercise. And so I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll just kind of cluster the movement specific chapters and just kind of quickly hustle through them. Um, so the, the, the first thing we start with, because we do get into strength training, cardiovascular, respiratory endurance, um, you know, resistance exercise, like deadlifting and squatting free weights, all we get into, you know, straight up training, but our first movement chapter is our first movement chapters are in stretching, mobility, flexibility, balance, and injury prevention. So we start with that. We start with that. We didn't put that as an afterthought, like, okay, after you crush yourself, and then, you know, uh, take care of yourself. We put the recovery piece on the front burner. So I'll speak to that. A I mean, you have spoken to that a little bit. This is, this is in the spirit of extracting ourselves from the suffer and struggle. Um, uh, but I think uh, the thing I'm excited about with this course is that we are prioritizing recovery uh, over, over crushing, <laughs> like recovery comes first crushing, you know, we don't really talk about crushing, but so maybe oh, there's, the, the word crushing appears in the text a few times just for fun, yes. just to keep people excited. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What's interesting, I, I'm thinking on, on that note, the way you just described that beautifully, uh, let me give you a window into the lifestyle and the training habits of elite athletes in every sport. Uh, the Olympians, the, the great sprinters. I'm fascinated watching Elaine Thompson, the fastest female probably of all time. Uh, heading into, you know, the world championships, which I'm going to attend the world track and field championships for the first time in America, um, watching these amazing uh, NBA basketball players, um, the, the, the cyclists that compete in the Tour de France. And we have this romanticized notion that these people are superhuman machines and they crush it uh, every day in training. Uh, but what's amazing is how they universally perform well within their capabilities on a day-to-day -day basis. So that term of crushing a workout, for them, it's just routine every day, going to work, uh, business as usual. Maybe the best example, and I think we actually, um, I forget what chapter, but I talk about um, Usain Bolt and Iliad Kipchoge. Kipchoge is the greatest marathon runner of all times, one of the greatest, maybe the greatest endurance athlete uh, that's ever walked on earth. And he's the guy who ran a 159 uh, for the marathon run. And Usain Bolt, of course, most people know that he's the greatest sprinter of all time. Um, and Kipchoge's training is, it's a sensational uh, performance week in, week out. He works very, very hard at high altitude. His easy day is an 18 mile run at six minute pace at high altitude. And so that'll bug your eyes out if you have any reference to what, uh, what running fast means. However, um, that's a minute and a half slower than his marathon world record pace. So he's literally jogging at six minute pace per mile. That has no reference to you or I or anyone else, a casual enthusiast, but it, what, it, what it shows is that these workouts are very impressive and minimally stressful to him and his buildup over years and decades and have the amazing genetic gifts, which we should also realize those people on top they might be better at recovering than you, all other things being equal. So don't try to model everything they're doing. And then on the Usain Bolt side, um, if you watch his beautiful biography on Netflix uh, and several books about him, he was universally characterized as quote unquote lazy in training, um, a party guy who liked to go out to the clubs and have fun. And he was always loosey goosey and goofy. You saw him with the camera on him right before they get into the starting blocks for the Olympic final. And he's doing all his gestures and his, po you know, his posturing and all that. And um, that was his true personality coming to life where he was in an ideal peak performance state because he wasn't all tightly wound and stuck on himself. And when he was feeling lazy and training, we all have to sit back and take a shallow breath and say, wait a second, 
This is the greatest sprinter of all time who peaked on demand like no other athlete to win again and again in the Olympics and the world championships. And so if he was feeling lazy or wanting to take some extra time in the off season to go to the clubs and loosen up and hang out, maybe he represents the, the highest level of sophistication of athletic training rather than the, remember the old Rocky four where it was Rocky against Drago, the, the, the Soviet creation where the, he was in the laboratory and everything was totally idealized where every workout was measured and his blood was sampled. It's like, no, 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 that's a movie. And here's the very best guy who likes to go to the beach and go to the clubs and then, you know, break world records. And so maybe we can all relax a little bit and realize that listening to those voices, especially uh, perhaps sometimes the lazy voice when we're talking about a high, highly motivated population, maybe mm -hmm. that's something to really honor and listen to and t dial every dial back one or two notches. And guess who's listening really closely to this? Brad Kearns right now, because I still struggle today with my wonderful enthusiasm and competitive intensity. I go out there, I do a workout. I know what I'm doing. I, kn I know about the right timing and the right warmups and all that. I feel great while I'm at it. And then the next 48 to 72 hours, I get these awakenings like, dude, you're in the 55 plus age division. You're not in the Olympic, you're not in the Olympic talent pool. What the hell was I thinking? And I get this message with tight calves, my heels burning up again, my right glute is locked up again, which is an indication that guess what? I overdid it. I exceeded my capabilities and I, I made essentially what amounts to a mistake through this devoted, awesome workout that I got smiley face into my training log because I wasn't properly and most intuitively uh, accepting that I need to tone down that competitive intensity at times. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I think mo like mobility, stretching, flexibility, and in, in every course I've taken gets a, like a nod. And oh, by the way, this is something Aaron mentioned, like it's, it's like an afterthought. I love the fact that we put this first. It's almost as though you need to truly be mobile and flexible to do any real movement well you know, yeah. and to do it safely and to get the benefit of the whole reason you're doing this in the first place. And I do think there are far more trainers that are not well-versed in how to use a foam roller properly, um, how to properly stretch a hip flexor. And there, I, I don't know how many people have come up to me and they're like, I have this thing right here. And they're pointing to essentially like that, that groin area, those little tendons that are between their legs. And they can, most trainers don't know how to help people, first of all, keep them from pulling it in the first place. Right. Um, and then, then teaching them how to kind of, um, I guess, I guess nurture it a little bit after that workout and, and understanding what some of the movements that they're putting people through, what these little muscles and tendons are going through and how to help them from the standpoint of not only mobility before you start your workout, but afterwards and in the days in between. So mm. I, I just think it being a foundational chapter in the beginning to make sure anyone taking this course understands the role it plays and how important it is, is super smart, you know, rather than having people burn through it. Because the rest of this stuff, like, there's something in here for literally everybody. You know, chapter six gets into cardio, fitness, and endurance. Uh, we get into substrate utilization and exercise intensities, aerobic function and foundation and the difference between um, that versus cardio, monitoring your heart rate, all of this stuff is built in there. We get into the benefits of high intensity exercise, because I know this is high intensity exercise is a favorite of a lot of people, whether it's the F45s, the CrossFit folks, the Orange Theory folks, um, that high intensity training. And we, we talk about that and the benefit of it. I just think for many people, it's, it's abused. It's misused. <laughs> Yeah, it's easy to overdo it. Tons of benefits and a higher risk factor too. And yeah. just um, for a simple, memorable takeaway, if you just shorten everything and turn all the dials down, you're going to get wonderful fitness stimulation with minimal risk. I'm thinking of uh, one of my heroes, the great high jumper, Mutaz Essa Barshim of Qatar. He's the number two high jumper of all time. He jumped seven, 11 and three quarters, which is the height of a typical ceiling in a, uh, in a typical home. And he just had an interview as we're building up to uh, the world championships. He won the gold medal last year in the Olympics, tied for the gold medal. Wonderful story with the Italian Gianmarco Tamberi. But he said, right now, my main goal in training is to not get injured. Oh, what a soundbite. 
I mean, he wasn't joking. It wasn't a throwaway line. That's his number one goal. And his number two goal is to win the gold medal. His number two goal, number three goal is to break the world record. Number four goal, whatever, whatever. But like, you, just as you were reading down the chapters, Laura, it's like, uh, guess what? Uh, hold on. Let me do a quick review here. I'm going to pull it up. Uh, doesn't matter if you're injured. This chapter, no, nope, doesn't matter if you're injured. This chapter, no, nope, doesn't matter. This chapter, no. Nope. Oh, sprinting, no, nope, doesn't matter if you're injured. <laughs> so you can skip a whole bunch of crap here if you're injured, <laughs> or you can go through the, the course in the order that it's uh, presented. Yeah, that was great. I was, I was thinking that too, because I'm battling an injury right now that came from doing stupid shit in the gym. And it's like, now I can't do anything. I can't do anything because I was hot dogging at one time for what hot purpose, I you. don't know. I hope we got it on video for your, your sensational Instagram account. I hope at least if you're going to get injured, yeah. go out swinging. Yeah, yeah. Like the parkour guy, Dom Tomato on Instagram. You ever seen him? He no. jumps off the this the cement uh staircase and lands on a wall pushes off does a backflip you know and like this crazy mm -hmm. stuff and it's all captured on video but man what a what a price to pay the the risk of getting a viral video is is pretty gnarly yeah, yeah i'm not about that yeah so really good so then then we we kind of close out the course with mindset peak performance overreaching overtraining and burnout i'm addicted to the fact that we have a chapter on this and uh rest recovery sleep and downtime and that's kind of from a, from a programming perspective where the fitness, our fitness, primal fitness course kind of winds down. Um, I know you did speak to overreaching over, you spoke to this, this suffer culture, but maybe just as a sort of parting thought, what is overreaching versus overtraining? Is there a difference between those two? There is like, well, how would you describe the difference between those two things? Yeah. I mean, uh, I think that's a new term that someone came up with and it's uh, appropriate to distinguish a little bit. Um, but I generally would love to avoid uh, e either of those, both of those. And so the overreaching is this temporary state of excess fight or flight stimulation, where actually in many cases you can feel awesome. And I went through this so many times in my athletic career where I would get into these training cycles as they call them where we go to the mountains at high altitude and slam it for six weeks. And we feel great every day because of the fresh air and the competitive setting and leaving your, uh, the responsibilities and the logistics of your everyday life behind. And you're at training camp and you're crushing it and you wake up the next day and guess what? You're not sore. You're alert. You're energized early in the morning. And we go out and do another one and the next day and the next day. And what happens when you push yourself to uh, a high level of uh, ask in your, in your performance goals, you start to stimulate the fight or flight response to keep up. And the body does a wonderful job uh, allowing you to perform at your peak um, over and over until it finally becomes exhausted. And I think you can draw an exact analogy physiologically to you had a family crisis, you're going to the hospital on vigil for 27 days in a row, uh, you're taking turns with the other loved ones and you're going to take the night uh, shift next time because uh, you, the other person deserves a break. And you wake up in the morning, your hands are a little shaky, you're not hungry, uh, you, you, someone's forcing you to take an apple with you so you'll have something to eat and you forget to eat it and you're just going on fumes for mm -hmm. hours and hours. Uh, how about going through a, a painful breakup or a crisis with a, a, a child? You know, these, these areas of life where we're just in crisis mode and we're burning fumes. However, if you were to, you know, ask, are you tired? No, I'm not tired. I don't need a nap. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to carry on. I'm going to push through. And that's a crisis, but it's the same physiologically as an elevated training binge or competitive binge or whatever you want to call it. And it's so common. And because it's pleasurable, enjoyable, rather than a crisis at the hospital or a breakup right. or a tough time with kids, um, you're just going with the flow, baby. It's like, yeah, I'm getting in better shape now. I just rode 80 yesterday. And today we did 67 and I felt great. And I dropped everybody on the last climb. And there are warning signs of impending doom. And that's what overreaching is all about. Um, and in doing the research for this section, it's really fascinating because it's very likely that every single world record in the endurance sports especially, was set by someone in a state of overreaching, in an unhealthy uh, hormonal state with, with excess fight or flight hormones bathing in their bloodstream. 
Um, I call it the cortisol shower head in the book, Primal Endurance, where you're just yeah. spraying cortisol every day, going out there and knocking out more impressive workouts. So um, if you can kind of head things off at the pass and shut things down because you intuitively realize that you're pushing beyond your previously known capabilities, that's when you become a really smart and highly attuned athlete rather than just a competitive uh, beast who can go out there and, and, you know, call upon, um, call upon the fumes to get stuff done that should never get done. I love that we have this. Over, yeah. <laughs> overtraining, you can go take the course and we'll tell you all yes. about it. And I, I do have to say with great pride that I believe this chapter of this course has the most exhaustive and specific and precise set of symptoms for both overreaching and overtraining that I've ever seen. And it required compiling data from the great leaders and articles and studies. And it's a, it is a definite highlight of the course. And if you can kind of commit all that stuff to memory and we have different categories. So we have like these digestive symptoms, we have cognitive symptoms, we have mood behavior, emotional symptoms, and of course the physical symptoms. You can't lift as much weight when you're at the gym. Duh, you're overtrained. But there's so many nuances that are important to understand. And it is, it's a beautiful experience to go through that. And there's really no turning back because once you understand, especially what overreaching is all about, and that's why I mentioned the family crisis, we can all nod our head and go, yeah, I recall, I recall. Yeah, I didn't sleep much. I was sleeping five hours a night and I got up every morning bright, bushy tailed as a bunny to go and suffer, suffer again. And um, boy, to get through life, we're going to be facing those kind of things. But please don't do it with your fitness programming. Otherwise, boy, um, you know, you're missing oh. out. Yeah. Well, and I, I see it all the time in my gym and it's people that are like, you know what, Coach Laura, I've plateaued. I can't, I can't lift anymore. You know, what should I be doing? How should I be training to get stronger? I'm like, take three days off. Mm. You need to rest. The benefit of any training comes in the recovery process. And if we don't actively coach people through how to recover properly, then all the training we're going to give you around endurance training or aerobic training, all the training we're going to give you around resistance training, because that's in there, all the education we're going to give you around sprinting and jumping, all that stuff is useless if the body doesn't have the ability to recover and come back stronger, faster, better. Um, so this needs to all be interwoven. And I, I think that's what you've done a phenomenal job with in here. We've taught the person taking this course. You're teaching them how to be a great trainer and how to use these different modalities, these different types of exercise to achieve the ultimate goal that the client might be looking for, which is going to be different from person to person. But you've interwoven this with all the other little aspects of their lifestyle and the ability for their body to actually gain what it needs to gain from the actual activity. And it's, it's a big missing link in a lot of the other programs out there. And I think people taking this are going to find themselves pretty well-rounded. Yes. Uh, well said. And I'm thinking of that athlete, which is so common, so familiar, that, that mindset, that personality that doesn't want to back off. And the secret here is we're not telling you to go sit on the couch and eat Ben and Jerry's. Right. The secret is to just, if you turn those dials down and formulate this ability to go into the gym and do a 70% session, or for me, it's going to the track. When I get to the track, when I get to the facility of the rubber track that goes around in a circle, I am lit up because I don't go there very frequently. And when I go there, I'm going to get work done and it's time to rock the, <laughs> the, the heavy metal tunes or the, you know, the, the, the major uh, the M&Ms coming out to play because this is, this is time to get down to business. And I finally realized I need to get to that track and have a 70% day. And that yeah. will, that's what will support my development of those days where it is time to open up the throttle a little bit more. And when you throw out these numbers without the context, like, yeah, 70 percent, uh, I lift at 70 percent of my one rep max or I do a, a 200 meter repeats at 70 percent of my best time. It's ridiculously slow to the extent that any competitive type is going to have to go. What are you serious? You want me to do bicep curls with 10 pounds? What? Um, excuse me. What for? And compare yourself right there in that quick example to the greatest athletes on the planet who are going to watch in the Olympics and in the pros, they are doing exactly that. They are performing well below their maximum capability. However, it looks way more impressive than you doing bicep curls with 10 pounds. It's just the exact, exact same context and training approach. Yeah. I love that. The analogy of the athletes is uh, really just interesting and, and incredible. And 
I don't know, Brad, I think you, you've, you've really knocked it out of the park with this curriculum and we really appreciate you running us through it with, uh, you know, your unique flair and <laughs> dynamism. You guys bring it out. You bring out the best of me. We rock well, it every time. If the stories and the context, I think, are what help bring it alive, particularly if people listening are trainers or people who have been in the fitness realm, they know what we're talking about because they've, they've seen it themselves. And um, so, you know, I, I think what you've built here is something fantastic for someone who wants to enter the fitness world. Mm -hmm. I think it's fantastic for people that are already there and want to just take a course that's developed from a different point of view. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but I also see it as people that work with high level athletes that need to teach these athletes just how to move for the sake of moving rather than always training for their sport. Mm -hmm. um, that, that I think gets missing when we see people that have been competitive for decades, yep. you know? Oh my gosh. Look at all the injuries in the mm -hmm. major sports. They've, yeah. they've never been trained because they're too much of a superstar from day mm -hmm. one. They were thrown right into the swimming pool to swim laps mm -hmm. and they, they can't run three miles without their knees aching, but who cares? I mean, so, so yeah, it, it extends across all levels from novice to elite. Yeah. I love it. It's cool. And we're going to teach people how to coach. So it's the, the emergence of the fitness coach. We are, we are sticking our flag in the ground. We're doing it. And we really appreciate Brad, mm -hmm. you um, developing this curriculum for us and for sharing your wisdom with us on this, on this chat. What a great show. I'm excited to participate in the program now that it's done. I'm going to go back as a student and, and, and learn everything. Oh my gosh, it's going to be fun. And don't forget chapter 15, how to get, how to get that body down to uh, your ideal body composition. It's such a prominent goal. Um, I remember one podcast guest, I had William Schufeld, um, who's a, you know, a, a six pack wielding fitness machine himself. Um, he's on the cover of our book, Carnivore Cooking for Cool Dudes. And um, he said, you know, everybody tries to downplay like, well, I want to, you know, I want to feel good and be energetic because people want to look hot. That's just there, you know, everyone kind of, um, you know, tries to, um, to gloss over that. But we tried to address it in the last chapter to say, look, if you're doing everything right and you want to drop that final 5, 10, 15, 20 pounds of excess body fat, let's give you a proper strategy here and just, just hit this thing head on rather than trying to dance around it. We know you're itching for, you're at the community center itching for a workout, I'm assuming. So we will. A very yeah. low level, turning those dials down. Yes. Don't be, don't be shy. Put those, put those plates on the lowest pin and check your ego at the door. Yeah. That's right. Cool. Thank you so much, Brad. This was great. We will, uh, we look forward to training some primal fitness coaches under your tutelage. Woohoo! Awesome. Thanks, Thanks for listening. Brad. This podcast was brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute. To learn more about how to become a successful health coach, get in touch with us by visiting primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or if you're already a successful health coach, practitioner, influencer, or thought leader with a thriving business and an interesting story, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us at hello at primalhealthcoach.com and let us know why we need to interview you for Health Coach Radio. Thanks for listening.